This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, I see a few new faces out there. I see a few new faces out there, so I'll just give a brief um, history of Medicine of Cycling and the Mini Medical School. Um, we started Medicine of Cycling with a very simple mission, um, to improve the health care and the quality of care that cyclists receive. Um, as it's turned out, that's been a very complicated thing to achieve. Um, but the Mini Medical School is a really important part of that because We've met so many incredible people over the past few years that are experts in their field. They also happen to race bikes or ride bikes on the side, and they're very passionate about the sport. And the sport, as we all know, is very unique in the sense that you know, you're moving, you're out there you know, in, in the wild and on the roads. Um, a lot of unique challenges uh, facing the medical professionals that are, that are dealing with uh, the sport of cycling. So, um, and there's lots of different ways to get involved with us. Um, we have some research projects that are ongoing. Um, you can join our mailing list, which has all sorts of interesting tidbits um, that we send out from time to time. Um, and I certainly encourage all of your uh, medical professionals that you work with, uh, massage therapists, physical therapists, um, MDs, et cetera, um, to, you know, if, if they're interested in cycling, um, definitely have the, them uh, reach out reach out to us. Um, we also have a website where we publish a lot of um, guidelines and publications that we've produced, um, concussion guidelines um, and concussion assessment cards. There's some articles about hip pain, knee pain, lots of topics that you know we've been covering in the med medical school. And we have articles um, on our blog at uh, medicineofcycling.com. And the slides for this evening's presentation um, will be posted tomorrow morning um, by the Office of CME. Um, and I guess the last uh, bit before we get started is, you know, please give us some feedback. Um, you can reach out to us on Twitter, we're Med of Cycling, um, or reach out to us either via a phone call or an email address, which is uh, available on our website. Um, we really want to make this better um, in the coming months and years, and having your feedback is a really important part of that. Um, Heather Schwartz is a registered dietitian who under earned her undergraduate degree in nutrition at Cal Poly. Um, San Luis Obispo while on a soccer scholarship. She earned her MS in nutrition from San Jose State and completed her internship at UCSF. For the past seven years, she's worked at Stanford um, with the heart and lung transplant team, uh, executive health program, and is the lead dietitian in the nutrition clinic where she provides medical nutrition therapy to prevent and manage health issues like diabetes and weight management. She also provides nutrition counseling and health coaching to athletes of all caliber from amateur to professional with a special passion for cyclists. So let's welcome Heather Schwartz. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Heather, my last name, my new last name is Garza, but I haven't updated it professionally yet. I'm still getting used to that rolling off my tongue. Um, so if you Google me, um, Heather Garza, Heather Schwartz, both of them are, are out there. Um, when he mentioned a passion for cycling, um, out of all the sports um, and athletes that I work with, cycling is the first one that pops up because I got engaged on a commotion um, tandem in Monterey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's a big part of it, but it certainly started a lot before then. I, I used um, as transportation in, in grade school, living out in the rural parts of San Luis Obispo um, College. I did a lot of um, cycling for fun, um, volunteered with the, the, the Cal Poly cycling team and also with the triathlon team doing a lot of nutrition coaching. Um, and then that kind of morphed into um, 
getting a great group of friends um, around me that a lot of them were cyclists. And I ended up meeting my husband, who was actually a pro triathlete, but cyclist to start with at UC Davis. So cycling kind of runs in my veins. Um, it's something that we talk about every single day, whether I want to or not. Um, it certainly is a big part of our budget, I can tell you that much, um, mine and his. Um, and so that's a little piece about me. I'm quite the casual speaker. I would like to take your questions while we go, but I've been informed that due to some time constraints and some efficiency, we're going to take questions at the very end. So if you could please write your questions down for me. Um, I very much would like to answer um, each one. And at the end, I also have my email um, at the la on the last slide, and, and we'll get to that too. All right, so to get started, I've got a couple objectives for us tonight. My first one is really to give you some handy tools that you can walk away with tonight. So I want you to actually be able to sit here and calculate your true numbers. So you get to walk out of here tonight knowing how much fluid you need on a daily basis, but also during rides. And I also want you to be able to walk out of here with an approximate number of calories that you, knew on a, that you need on a day-to-day -day basis, but then also during rides. So that's my goal for you tonight. Um, and we're going to do that, we're going to accomplish that by first looking at hydration, which is probably, if you had to choose water over, uh, or food on a ride, I would hope that you'd choose water. Um, so we're going to talk about how much you need, when you need it, and how to get it in, uh, what kinds of fluid your body needs and when during your ride, and then also, of course, after your ride um, for um, repletion purposes. The second objective is really focusing on food and fuel. Um, again, same idea, when, how much, how, it's, how we're going to get it in, um, before, during, and after your ride. And if we have time, we'll get into supplements um, or ergogenic aids. I did not include that in my slide presentation, but um, I can certainly answer any questions and, and tell you what the latest and greatest literature has to say. So first, nutrition in and out of the saddle, really different concepts. Um, in the saddle, you have extremely high calorie needs based on METs or metabolic equivalents. You might need 12, 13, up to 18 times the amount of calories on the bike than you do off the bike, just to throw out some numbers there. So you can appreciate how different your, body, um, your body's fuel needs are. Um, for most of us sitting in this room, we need a diet that looks something like 60% carbohydrate and carbs are those starches and, and um, sugars like fruits and whole grains, dairy products, um, your pastas and your breads, about 20% protein, eggs, fish, chicken, beef, lentils, tofu, about 20% fat, hopefully most of those being healthy fats from um, plant-based foods, a little bit coming from animal products. Um, but then when we look at race day needs or, or ride needs, not necessarily ri or in a competitive event, but even just a, a leisurely ride, um, your needs change. So they go from that everyday uh, macronutrient distribution um, to something quite significantly different. And that's because when you are doing aerobic activity, such as cycling, no matter what speed or, or cadence you're pushing, um, your body prefers to use carbohydrates as its fuel. So it looks at fat, it looks at protein, and goes, ah, those are way too much work to break down and deal with right now. We're going to do carbs. Carbs are quick and easy, and we all know that, right? Hard day, you drink the beer, you chocolate almonds, um, whatever, you know, the baguette, whatever it is, um, you know, it's the quick up, pick, picker upper, right? And that's what your body's craving when you're cycling. Um, ideally, for everyday nutrition, you also want to distribute your calories pretty evenly throughout the day. And there's more and more research coming out that's really promoting this as the most healthful way um, to maintain your weight and or lose weight if you need to and or gain weight if you need to. Um, so we're really looking at distributing your calories pretty evenly throughout the day. So not crescendoing, which is what most of us do, right? We diet at breakfast. Um, we're going to start our diet at breakfast, right? We're going to eat a small bowl of cereal and a little milk and, and a giant coffee. Right? And then lunch, oh, we're going to go out, we're going to be really, we're still good, we got all this willpower, we're going to be pretty good, we're going to have half the sandwich. And then holy schmoly, 3 o'clock comes around. Right? And what do you do? You go for the snacky stuff, the crunchy stuff, the sweet um, or salty stuff, and then you have a giant whopper of a dinner, and maybe you top it off with a Ben and Jerry's. Right? So your calories kind of crescendo. Unfortunately, most of us do most of our 
exercise in the beginning part of the day, either morning or mid-afternoon. So we're burning our calories, we're expending our calories in the beginning part of the day, but we're taking in our calories at night, which really causes the body to go into this feast and famine situation. And let me tell you, we're real good um, at surviving, right? We've been, we're around, we've started a long time ago, we're still around, and the reason is because we're so good at hoarding extra calories. So when you go into that feast and famine mode, it um, puts quite a bit of stress on your body, and, and generally we are excellent at hoarding, so any extra calorie you eat, you hold on to. Um, and lastly, I put honor your hunger and thirst up there, because we can talk numbers all night long, but what it comes down to is some of the best cyclists in the world have no idea exactly how many calories they need, exactly how much fluid they need. I'm sure their trainers are throwing it down their throats, but they don't actually know the numbers. None of us here, I don't know my exact numbers. They're all estimates upon estimates upon estimates. So really, if you listen to your body, meaning that when you feel hungry, you eat. Um, when you feel thirsty, you drink. Um, we find that that in combination with eating healthful foods in a, in a nice, um, even distribution tends to promote the most health. Right? We've looked at studies where people know exactly how many calories and grams of protein and grams of fat they need, um, and those people don't tend to do any better or, or um, worse than people who have no idea and are just going by their instincts. So I'm not up here trying to tell you that you need to know your numbers. Um, what I'm hoping to do is show you what kind of numbers your body might need, and then I want to translate that into food. Right? So I want to give you something that you can work with. Um, last time, lastly, excuse me on this slide, um, is changing, possibly changing your diet and hydration for cycling needs worth it? You know, it sounds like it's a lot of work, especially if you've done something for a long time, you're satisfied with your performance, maybe you're like, nah, you know, why do I need to worry about it? Um, well, let me tell you, let me tell you why. Um, I'm a pretty good car salesman. Um, I do this all day long with patients, so let me tell you why you might want to think about um, changing your habits a bit. First is, is quantitatively. Most cyclists, even r recreational cyclists, um, you want to go faster, you want to go harder, you might want to go longer, right? Even the novice cycler, those are kind of our, a lot of our aspirations. And then, of course, as you kind of move up the ranks, you're looking at, you know, KOMs, you've got Strava going on, um, you know, you're racing your next door neighbor to work, um, <laughs> what have you. Um, and so then you, you, so there's these quantitative things that we put a lot of value into, and nutrition can certainly help you meet all of those goals, meaning going faster, going harder, and going longer. Um, on the qualitative side, it can also make you feel better, it can make you enjoy your exercise more. Um, you might be able to enjoy your surroundings more. You're certainly gonna be more aware of cars or people around you. Um, you'll recover faster. Um, and if you're well hydrated and well nourished in a ride, you actually do more good for your body, meaning that your body actually gets more out of that than if you go into it dehydrated or underfueled or overfueled, where you can actually do some detriment to your body. So adequate hydration and nutrition um, is just absolutely, in, in my biased viewpoint, um, paramount to, to enjoying your, your ride and, and doing satisfactory on your ride as well. Um, and then is it worth your time? I should have put money, too, because that's a big driving factor, let's be honest. So this is a discussion that I have with my husband, who's not a dietitian, um, but it has our living room is bikes, I'll just say that. We don't have art, we have bikes on the walls. Um, and it's a constant discussion we have, is that he drops you know, a small fortune. Um, on you know the latest the latest helmet that just came out we've got you know 808s all over the place we've got you know seat posts that are 30 grams lighter than the seat posts from last week <laughs> right to shave off 30 grams I once showed him in sugar cubes what 30 grams was and he was like I paid that each sugar cubes like 300 bucks I'm like yeah <laughs> right uh, maybe just eat less sugar I don't know but. Um, so certainly there's a, a financial advantage too to put in putting a lot of effort into your hydration and nutrition before you go out and you spend the big bucks on um, the aero equipment. Not knocking aero equipment whatsoever. Um, there's some great research that suggests that having all the best specced out gear possible in a time trial of about 40K or so in a wind tunnel with a highly um, you know, fit athlete, an endurance athlete, if you give him 
all of the best aero equipment out there, you might be able to shave off five to six minutes off of a 40K, right? If the person goes in, same person, same wind terminal, same conditions, um, decent bike, but not fully specced out, and you give him no nutrition or very poor nutrition, poor hydration, um, he might be up to 12 minutes off his time. So very significant, right? You can, uh, you can appreciate that in all the research that we have, it was actually a meta-analysis done. Um, it suggests that nutrition and hydration actually saves more time on the bike than does the best aero equipment money can buy. So, you know, on the flip side, my husband's like, yes, but if I combine both, <laughs> right? That's where that gets me. Oh, and this is actually a picture of one of my husband's bikes when I first met him, and I just thought it was the funniest thing because he has it on the scale. Everything goes on the scale. Everything's like, how much does it weigh? Right, and he got this bike down, I think this was one of his road bikes, down to 14 pounds, right, which is ridiculous. Um, but yet he had gained about six pounds in the time that I'd met him, because I'm a really good baker. I love baking, and so I was like, ooh, I don't know how that works out in the long run. Um, so moving on to hydration, um, that's where I really want to do a lot, of, a lot of focus tonight, and I hope you get some good information out of this. Um, Again, everyday hydration, uber important. Everyday hydration certainly trumps hydration just on the bike. If you go into a ride dehydrated, no matter how much you drink on the bike, your body is not going to be replenishing its tissues properly. You will be in a deficit and you will be chasing that dehydration um, probably for the next day, maybe up to the next two or three days. So certainly you wanna go into your rides hydrated. And how do you do that? Well, you start with around 30 to 35 mLs per kg. So if you take your body weight, divide it roughly by 2.2 for those of you who have devices or smartphones on you, and you multiply it by 30 to 35 mLs per, per kilogram. And you get a nice big number, somewhere around 2,000, my guess would be somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000. And that would be your everyday fluid needs. And that's enough to meet, um, you know, our bodies are over 80% water, so that it's enough to kind of keep your body in equilibrium so you stay nice and cool. Um, you can also stay nice and warm. It allows good tissue perfusion, so your mouth isn't dry, your eyes aren't dry, your skin is nice and hydrated. And our brains float in water, so you can appreciate what happens when there's not enough water for the brain. Um, those are your office mates or your friends or family that get really grumpy. Um, offer them some water next time. Um, it does wonders actually quite quickly. And there's great research study um, about three years ago done on um, both amateur and also professional athletes and athletes of all different calibers um, and all different sports actually. Most of it was done on basketball players but it's also football players, cyclists, and triathletes. And what they found is that just a slight change in your weight from before your ride and after your ride, just a slight weight change, uh, reflects dehydration, that can result in a significant decline in your performance. Performance meaning not just physical performance, not just you know how many um, watts you're pushing, how many, how many mets you're pushing, but also your, um, your qualitative performance, meaning how much did you enjoy your ride, when did you perceive that you were getting tired, so the perception of fatigue is significantly declined. So for example, my husband weighs about 170, 165 um, pounds, which is roughly 75 kgs. So if over a two-hour ride he comes back and he weighs about three pounds less, his performance probably suffered by about 5%. So over a you know, two-hour ride, probably about six minutes he suffered um, if he's looking at his, at his time and that's his marker. Um, and I can spot right away when he comes back when he's dehydrated, generally because he's very grumpy and in his, his walk over to where he aligns his Garmin with his... Garmin software, whatever that is, how they talk to each other. He usually like comes by and gives me a kiss and then goes straight to the, to the machine. If he's dehydrated, I get no kiss. <laughs> so that's how I figured it out. Um, so let's talk individual hydration needs on the bike. So let me back up. The last slide was just everyday, nutrition, uh, everyday hydration. You need about 30 to 35 mLs per kg every day on average, give or take, every day. Um, so for him, that's about almost three liters. So those liter water bottles, I think someone has one up there, it's about three of those a day. And when I say fluid, I mean, I'm sorry, it doesn't have to be water, it can be fluid. And 
and much to the chagrin of many um, healthcare providers out there, we now know that coffee counts. So all of you Phil's fans can can cheer um, because coffee now counts. So coffee, tea count as fluid. Um, and um, you know your juices, your soups, all of those things count as well. Um, probably one of the best indicators of hydration, since I don't want anyone to go home and count the milliliters of fluid that they drink, is the color of your urine. Right? The lighter it is, the better. And the darker it gets, the more dehydrated you are. If you have kind of lemon-colored urine, you are probably dehydrated and probably have been for about 12 to 18 hours already. Right, so take a look in the bowl. It's a really good barometer of your hydration status. And that includes when you come back from a ride, your urine should still be very nice and light colored. It's a great barometer. So let's talk a little bit of numbers here to help you figure out exactly what you need on a ride. Um, best way to do it is a sweat rate. I mean, it's something that you can do at home. Um, and it's some, this is something that you don't have to do if you're out there for recreational rides less than an hour. But if you're out riding for more than an hour, um, if you're riding at high intensities, if you're doing some hill, hill climbing, if you are in heat, um, or if you're, doing a, if you're a multi-sport athlete, I do recommend doing a sweat rate just to kind of get a grasp on, on how many cages you need, um, what kind, you know, if you want to space out, um, if you're going to use fluid on the course to see how many miles apart the aid stations are, this is a really helpful, really helpful tool. Um, so you take your pre-ride weight, like let's say you're going to go on a ride at 8 in the morning. Before you go eat breakfast, you hop on the scale and you look at your weight. All right, you come back from your ride, you check your weight. And now you've got two numbers, you subtract those ones from each other and you multiply it by 16 ounces, which is approximately um, how much fluid is in, in one kg. Then you take that number, which is probably pretty darn small, I'm hoping, um, and you're going to add all the fluids that you drank during your ride. So if you had two water bottles, you have two cages on your bike, each water bottle is generally 20 ounces. Right? There are some water bottles that are up to 28 or so, but most of them are 20 ounce bottles. 24, right? Some of them are 24 if you can fill them all the way to the very top. Um, but for spillage and whatnot, we say 20 just to be safe. But if you can do it, go with 24. Um, and so you add those two together and you get how many ounces you've had over how, many, how long you've been riding. And it's based on hours, not minutes. Um, so then basically you do a little divide, uh, dividing, so you do A plus B, um, you get that total, you divide it by the hours of ride, and that's how much fluid approximately that you need per hour. So an example here, my husband goes out on a two hour ride, um, he lost a pound, a, a, a kilogram and a half, um, we multiply by, by the fluid that it's gonna take to replace that, we get 24 ounces, he also, and then he drank 40 ounces, so he drank two, bottle, two bottles of water on his ride, so over two hours, he's had 64 ounces left his body in the form of fluid, and he's taken in 40 ounces. So we have a total of um, 64 ounces divided by two hours, so 32 ounces per hour, right? So what this is telling me is that he comes back dehydrated, right? Um, this is the, the, what's recommended by the um, ACSM. Mm -hmm. And there's some insensible losses as well. So based on this, you can kind of come up with how many, how many ounces of fluid that you need to take with you or that you need to find on your ride, right? Temperature change generally increases your fluid needs, um, and we don't have a, a set calculation, so there's not necessarily a, a positive correlation between temperature and fluid needs um, that we can actually um, quantify, so to speak, but generally, absolutely. And you'll see that because you'll probably be losing more weight right on your ride and so certainly if you're you know riding in the bay area in a temperate climate and then you're going to go to colorado springs and do some riding um you're certainly going to want to do your sweat you can recalculate your sweat rate anytime you'd like so this is just a sample of the hydration schedule that's been recommended by the acsm which is the american college of sports medicine for cycling um one or two hours before we're hoping that you get in at least two to three cups of fluid again it doesn't have to be water two to three cups of fluid in the first in an hour or two hours before you ride. Then right before you ride, 30 minutes, maybe in the car ride um, to the parking lot where you're gonna ride or while you're getting ready, you wanna sip on another at least one to two cups of fluid or eight to 16 ounces. 
Um, if you're planning on going on a long ride, again, long ride being defined as over 60 minutes, you probably want to look at maybe substituting that water with some kind of carbohydrate source. So you might be wanting to do half juice, half water. You might want to switch to a Gatorade or something with a little bit of carbohydrate. Again, that only applies if you're going to be riding for longer than an hour. And then again, if you're going wrong for an hour, you probably want to be sipping on something every 15 minutes on your ride. And I know this is a really tough number to swallow on the bike. It's very hard for me to do that, and I can appreciate how it's, it's very difficult to um, add this new habit, but it certainly is a habit that can be formed, um, but it does take effort. Oftentimes we recommend using, um, like if you have a cyclometer, every five miles is generally about 15 minutes or so, depending on um, how fast you're going. But about every five miles on your cyclometer is a good way to go, ah, yeah, need to drink something. I need to have a gulp or two of water, right? Um, and then within an hour after you come back from your ride, we'd like you to have another at least three to four glasses of water or fluid again. And it sounds like a lot, and I can appreciate that. And water is weight, and most cyclists don't want to carry a lot of weight on them. And I know that's a big barrier as well. Um, but I think that if you tried it, if you were a guinea pig on yourself just about two or three times, I think that you would want to continue the habit because, again, you'd feel better, you'd recover faster, and you'd certainly be able to go faster, harder, and longer. So how to hydrate. So I just mentioned some barriers there. Um, general rule of thumb, drink four to six times an hour. It's a great way to get in adequate amounts of high, uh, fluid. Um, so sports drinks versus water drinks on the ride, versus water on the ride, excuse me. That's a, it's quite controversial, um, and I, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to, to personal preference and, and, and flavors. A lot of people don't like a lot of the sweetened beverages out there, and they'd rather do it with food, right? You can either eat your carbohydrates or you can drink them. Again, this mostly applies to cyclists who are riding for longer than an hour. Um, if you are riding longer than an hour, ACSM and every other sports body out there does recommend some kind of fluid that contains carbohydrate. All right, so switching over to a Gatorade, a Powerade, and a Celerade, um, some of Hammer's um, drinks out there, you can make your own. There's plenty of websites out that there for pennies on the dollar. You can make delicious homemade tasting carbohydrate drinks. Um, but not only do you want to replace the electrolytes that are being lost through your sweat um, and that your muscles are using, but also the, the carbohydrates and some of the electrolytes in those drinks actually help your body absorb the fluid that you're trying to drink. So it actually grabs the fluid and helps get it into the gut and into the tissues a little bit faster than if it was just water by itself. Um, we find that the, the energy um, um, distribution to the cells and the tissue increases significantly. So practice hydration proficiency, AKA, try to form a good habit around hydration. It takes time, it's not easy, you're not gonna get it every time. Um, in fact, I've gone out on rides and completely forgot water bottles. I think most of us have done that at some point. Um, but it, you know, certainly again, try to be a guinea pig for yourself and, and at least a couple times, um, really try some of the, the guidelines that I'm recommending. I think that you'll find it extremely beneficial. Um, so some of the things we talk about doing um, with, the, with some of the triathlon teams that I coach is we talk about practicing, you know, grabbing your water bottles during rides, especially like on hill climbs or in pelotons. It's not easy. It takes some skill to do that. You're certainly not going to drink if you don't feel comfortable grabbing your bottles and switching them and what have you. Um, switching hands, that can be a tough thing. Um, swapping cages, use of jersey pockets if you have hydration in there. Um, and then timing is really big. So we try to say drink before you're thirsty. If you wait till you're thirsty on a ride, your urine's probably already getting dark. You're probably already dehydrated. You're certainly not at peak hydration um, during your ride. So along that line, which sports drinks are best? And there's some really um, narrow guidelines that the research has given us to choose our, our um, carbohydrate um, enhanced fluids. And those are that if you're riding between zero to three hours, we really want you to have a carbohydrate source that's mixed in the type of sugars it contains. So we want a carbohydrate source that has glucose, fructose, sucrose, maltodextrin, or other kinds of glucose polymers. We find that the mixture of carbohydrates greatly enhances um, energy distribution in the body and also fluid um, absorption. 
Um, so when you look on the back of the of a goo, or you look on the, I'm sorry, not goo, um, a Powerade scoop, or if you look on the back of Gatorade, it will actually list the ingredient label. And what I'd like you to look for um, the next time you pick one of those things up, if you do, um, is to make sure that there's different types of sugars. It shouldn't just say just glucose or just sucrose or just high fructose corn syrup. Right? It should be a mixture of different kinds of sugars. We also want to make sure that it's about a 6 to 8% carbohydrate solution. Now, does it say that on the label? Absolutely not, which is why I've listed some examples here for you. Um, we'd also like it to have some sodium in there. 75 milligrams is really a drop in the hat. It's not much whatsoever. And the other types of electrolytes like potassium and chloride are even smaller generally in most of these foods, but you don't need much if you're going between zero and three hours. Again, um, certainly depends on um, intensity, um, temperature, hill climbs, and those things. But as a general rule of thumb, some of the examples here um, all fit the bill. I've kind of done most of the work for you. There's a lot of marketing. Clearly, there's a lot of marketing involved in sports, um, supplements, sports drinks, sports foods. Um, and most of them have advertised with the mindset that more is better. And that is certainly not the case when it comes to carbohydrates and fluid intake. More is not better on the bike. And I'm sure many of you have gone out for the belly-busting burrito and then hopped on your bike and found that out very quickly. Um, so we know that more is not better, and that's the case with carbohydrates. It's the case with sodium, um, potassium, and some of the other electrolytes even in, in the fluids. Uh, moving on, if you're an endurance racer or if you're a multi-sport racer um, doing some of the longer courses, the same idea applies with ingredients. You want the mixed carbohydrates still. You certainly want some sodium um, in there because your sweat, weights, excuse me, sweat rate is probably greater. Um, so our parameters change a little bit, and so our examples also change a little bit. And a key um, to look at packages and, and, and on the foods is what they're going to start saying, endurance on them or long-lasting energy. And those are some good signs that it's probably geared towards the, the more endurance athlete. Um, if you take that when you're doing the zero to three hours, is it going to hurt you? No, but it's probably not um, going to optimize your performance by any means. In fact, it could slow you down a little bit. Um, the zero to three, I mean, the three hour and greater drinks tend to be a little bit more concentrated. And so they can cause a little bit of GI upset if you're not um, adequately hydrated with them. And generally, the people that are doing more than three hour rides are folks that are paying attention to their hydration um, levels beforehand. But are they going to hurt you? Probably not. Um, if you do have those at home and you want to use them for shorter rides, I'd recommend probably diluting them, maybe 50-50, with water and then half of um, the concentrated version. So the difference is there's more electrolytes in the... In the oh, there's more everything. There's going to be more carbohydrates. There's going to be more electrolytes. Um, and there might be a little bit of protein added. Absolutely. And we'll get that into that in the, in the fueling portion in just a moment. Good question. All right, so let's switch now from hydration over to fuel. Um, so how much do I get to eat every day? So we're going to do kind of the same idea um, with fuel as we did with, with um, fluids. The first is what's your everyday calorie needs? Right? And it helps to be able to contrast and compare your everyday needs versus your needs on the bike. Um, and, and keeping in mind that your everyday needs, most of us spend 90 plus percent of the time off the bike, right? So you can appreciate that you're paying attention to your everyday needs is significant, uh, much more so than the time spent on the bike. Certainly if you're looking for, for weight management, um, weight loss or weight gain. But um, so that 90% or plus time that we're spending off the bike, our calorie needs are much, much less, right? They're around 30 to 35, which is a similar number of the fluid. Um, calories per kilogram, right? That's a really simplified version. If you're looking for a little bit more um, in-depth numbers, things that take into account your height, your weight, your gender, um, your age, and your activity level, then you might want to look at a couple other equations. I didn't list them here, um, but Harris Benedict is, is you know, was was. Uh, is an equation that many of us are familiar with. And, and what a lot of um, fitness applications use, or um, I smartphone apps, a lot of websites use it, the kind where you put in your information, it spits out a number really quickly. They're probably using Harris Benedict. Um, personally, I don't love Harris Benedict. It's been proven to ha be, have about a 30% 
error in it. Certainly if you're an outlier, so to speak, so if your weight is a little on the high end or your weight's on the low end or if you're a little too tall or if your age, heaven forbid, is on either side of normal, um, Harris Benedict might not be a good fit for you. Um, a better fit would be something called the Mifflin St. Gior or MSJ. Um, a lot of websites are now starting to switch over to using that equation. If you know your percent body fat, there are other equations like the Cunningham equation. If you know your METs, if you know your watts, there are other equations for that. So there are many different um, calorie um, expenditure calculations that exist. And Harris Benedict or 30 to 35 kcals per kilogram is kind of the most popular ones out right now. Um, so for example, if you're a 75 kilogram person and you do 30 to 35, you get roughly 22, 25 to 26, 25 calories a day. If you did Harris Benedict on the same exact person who now were, was Harris Benedict, we actually use height, use some other anthropometrics, we get 2,400 calories, which is pretty much smack dab in the middle of 30 to 35. And it's just an estimate, right? These are just rough estimates to see where we're at. Um, so on an everyday basis, what kind of fuel do you need? Again, meaning most of your time um, when, you're off the, when you're off the bike, what kind of fuels do you need? 60 to 70% carbohydrate. If you are an endurance athlete, I don't know how many of you are, or if you are a competitive cyclist, or a competitive multi-sport person, or perhaps you're a swimmer, or what have you, um, you're probably looking at the higher end there, so at least 70% carbohydrate, um, up to 80%. So, um, you know, um, Tour de France, some of those cyclists, were Tour de California, we're really pushing 80% carbohydrate. So if you've got a plate, 80% of that plate is carbohydrate. All right, that's different than the everyday person who needs closer to 50 to 60%. Again, carbohydrate being the preferred fuel source um, for aerobic activity. Um, so if this person here um, were to come into my office, I'd recommend around 2,400 calories, 360 grams of carb, 55 grams of fat, 120 grams of protein, um, spread evenly throughout the day. And what I'd do, I'd give them a meal plan so that they don't have to count numbers, but they can kind of interpret it into food. So moving along, let's look at pre-ride fueling. Um, and the goal here is really to top off your natural stores of energy in the body, which come from your liver and your muscle glycogen. Glycogen is really stored carbohydrate. It's instant energy that's available to your muscle tissues when you're doing aerobic activity. Um, so three to four hours before a ride, um, you need around 800 calories. That sounds shocking to most people. Most people are like, Heather, my event's at 8 a.m. I'm not going to wake up at 5 and eat 800 calories. Shocking. I can, I can guarantee you competitive cyclists do this. My husband annoyingly wakes up at about 3 a.m. before Wildflower and scarfs two giant, and he's half asleep. He drinks two glasses of orange juice. He, drinks a, he eats a giant bagel with jam all over it. Um, and usually a coffee or something like that um, to try to get in enough calories to kind of fuel up and top off his glycogen scores. He goes back to bed. We're in the car. We're camping. We get up in the morning. He eats another um, about 300 calories, so generally like a bowl of cereal, some milk, and he usually starts doing some, some gels and goos at that time. Um, but your focus before your rides is high carb. Right? You leave the, the high fat, the, all the Mediterranean diet stuff that's out in the news right now, you leave that in the wayside, and you, you know, let Dr. Atkins turn over in his grave because you're going carbs. You're hitting carbs hard before your pre-ride, right? You're topping off your fuel sources. Um, if you're going only for an hour or less, do you need to go out and do have the giant bagel for morning? No, you don't. But if you're going longer for an hour or if you're going at a really high intensity, you do want to hit the carbs. You know, while you do that, you want to stay away from fiber. Um, you want to stay away from a lot of fat. Those things tend to sit in the stomach, break down very slowly, cause you to feel very full, maybe bloated, maybe gassy on your ride, um, very uncomfortable. Um, so here's a quick example. Um, again, kind of based that off of, off of my husband. Um, he chooses Accelerate. He just likes the flavor. Um, so I. I should say that no one is paying me to put their products on here. Um, I tend to actually make my own, so I don't usually use products. Um, just a f uh, flavor preference. But here's just a quick and dirty rundown of, of carbs, protein, fat, and, um, and a nice example at the bottom. And it's basically fuel choices. Are you going to put you know, 89 into the Porsche Turbo? Probably not. 
right? And so 89, these are some decent foods here. I even included cookies and candy and whatnot in there. Those are kind of our everyday foods. But when you're looking to kind of improve your performance or improve your enjoyment on the ride, you want to switch over and use kind of 91, right? These are kind of heart healthy, um, kind of heavier in carbohydrate, but healthy carbohydrate foods that also give you a lot of other nutrients. So, you know, again, yes, we're focusing on, on calories and numbers, but the big picture is overall health. And we're trying to make sure that you deliver um, adequate vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, phytochemicals to every cell in your body, both on and off the ride. So you really want to choose the 91 fuel column there. So how much fuel for your ride? This is going to be extremely different based on every person in this room, based on your needs, um, based on your METs. METs is really based on your basal metabolic rate. One MET is your body at rest. So when Strava or when Training Peaks tells you your METs, it's estimating based on your height, your weight, your age, your activity factor. Um, and it is basically suggesting when you're going to ride, how many... Um, how many times, oh, how would I explain this? I'm sorry. Um, how much more work are you doing than your basal metabolic rate? So when you're just sleeping, when you're at rest, you burn, let's say, 1,000 calories. If you do five METs, you're burning five times that amount at rest. Does that make sense? If you're pushing 19 METs, you're working really hard. Um, you're pushing 19 times the amount of energy to do that work than the work that you are doing it just at rest. And so that's METs for you. Watts are a little bit different. Um, so this is the, the, one of the quickest um, ways to figure out how many calories you need during the ride, not during the day, but just during the ride. You take a number um, that's based on the, the compendium of physical activity. I included it as a resource on, on my last slide. You can just Google it, it's uh, free public access. And what it'll tell you is based on the miles per hour that you generally do, so you do 12, out, 12 miles per hour, um, it'll give you the METs that are associated with that based on um, large studies that have been done. Um, they figure out approximately how, many, how much energy that requires. Um, you multiply it by 3.5 and, the, and then your weight. You divide it by 200, and at the end you get kcals per minute. So I typed in... Um, my husband's needs. And let's just say at 12 METs, um, which is about 15 to 19 miles per hour, multiply it by 3.5, then by his weight, divide it by 200. And he basically needs 15, almost 16 calories per minute. Multiply that by 60, he's approximately burning 945 calories per hour. And that's for a 165 pound man. Right? And again, that's just on the ride. That's not every, that's not when he's off the ride, but just on the ride. So he needs to replace, ideally, around, I mean, you can't, re, you can't eat, I'm not going to ask you guys to eat um, calorie for calorie on the bike. There's no way you're going to eat a Big Mac and fries and a shake when you're on the bike for an hour. Wouldn't want you to do that. Um, but it's just to show you how many, how many, uh, how metabolically active your body is when you're on the bike. Um, so for a two-hour ride, let's say he does, let's say he keeps that pace up approximately for two hours, he needs about 4,290 calories when I add the ride on to his normal average day, because his average day again was around 2,400, right? So for ride days, he needs around 4,200, 4,300 calories a day. On non-ride days, 2,400. So you can see the significant difference there. Um, but I'm, again, bringing in honor your hunger first, calorie second, because certainly I'm not going to be like, oh, you'll need, Steve, you'll need 3,200 calories. Um, you still need, you know, another 1,000. And he's like, I'm not hungry. I'm so full. I'm not going to like, eat it. That's not going to happen, right? <laughs> so you need to honor your hunger. And you'll notice that on days when you're really riding hard, you're not going to be that hungry. Oftentimes you're kind of queasy, a little nauseous maybe. You're not hungry right after the ride. You need a couple hours to cool down. Then maybe the hunger kicks in. Right? So it's not, it's not that you need to pack all of those calories in into a, a finite period of time. Your body works in, in averages. Right? It doesn't work in a 24-hour spot. It's not like, oh, you know, we're 1,000 calories deficit um, in this 24-hour time period, so we're going to lose a half a pound. It doesn't work like that. Right? Everything's kind of spread out over averages. I know I'm running short on time, so I'm going to get through the next few slides here. So fueling in the saddle, just like hydration, we have some guidelines that we try to follow. If you're riding for less than an hour, um, you generally don't necessarily need water. We recommend it, 
It's always good to have water there. You never know if you're going to flat or who knows what. It's nice to have some water there. But do you absolutely need it? Um, no. Does your tissues need it? Are you going to bonk? No. Um, but that's assuming that you're going into your ride semi-hydrated. If you're going into your ride dehydrated, then yes, you're going to want to consider taking um, some water with you. Do you need carbohydrate in those 60 minutes? No. Um, sometimes I need caffeine on my ride to work. So sometimes I'm the rider with like the coffee, but I'm not doing it for an energy purpose. And my ride is six, certainly not longer than 60 minutes here. Um, so if you're riding for about one to two hours, we recommend about replace, uh, 30 grams of carbohydrate um, being replaced through some kind of fluid or food. You could do it either way, right? You can drink it in the shape of orange juice. Or you could drink it in a sports drink. Or you could do it with water and then eat 30 grams of carbohydrate, right? Which would be approximately one goo um, or sport beans, or it could be half a bagel, right? So you can choose which way, if you want to drink it versus eat it. If you go for a little bit longer, you can see how the numbers actually um, double, or go up by 50%, excuse me, and then I've just given you some samples on the side. Again, there's people that are very loyal to um, engineered fo foods or sports foods, but I've also given you some examples of how to do it with just net normal foods. And it's just certainly based on tolerance, which leads me to my next slide, that tolerance is absolutely king of the mountain when it comes to eating and drinking on your rides. Yes, I'm giving you lots of numbers, but if you can't tolerate it, it's not worth anything, right? And, and again, this is something that needs to be built up. You need to try, you need to do some trials and tribulations with your hydration and your, and your nutrition on the rides. Um, to see what your body can tolerate. There's a lot of folks that can tolerate orange juice on an empty stomach when they're riding for two hours, and there's certainly a lot of folks that can't and do much better with, with Accelerate or Powerade or one of those drinks. Because um, we all know, we, I think many people, if you've, if you've gone for longer than an hour or so, it's common to get GI distress. I think about 15% of cyclists generally um, experience some kind of stomach discomfort on their rides, largely due to either dehydration Overnutrition, eating too much or drinking too much. Also, undernutrition, eating too little or, or drinking too little. So, again, just like hydration, where you need to build into as a habit, we recommend kind of practicing um, nutrition on the bike. And for the professional athletes that I work with, it is one of the toughest things to do is to practice. You never want to um, sacrifice your performance by trying to, to do a new food. But um, certainly recommend it before, certainly before you join a competitive event. Um, so lastly, fueling for recovery, we have a mantra in my office that your workout is not finished until you've refueled. And so we'll get off the bike, woo, done with that, let's go on with the rest of the day. Uh-uh, sorry, you're, even if you're an amateur cyclist but you're looking to gain performance, you're certainly not done until you've refueled. Um, and refueling generally means that you're eating a couple hundred calories. You're eating some sodium, you're eating some carbohydrates, and maybe a little protein, a little bit of fat to replace the lost energy that you expended on your ride. And I've given you some, some examples at the bottom. Again, whole foods versus um, engineered foods. Um, I'll let you read this on your own time with the slides tonight, but this is just an um, a example of what um, approximately um, 4,300 calories looks like. Um, in food. So there's no numbers here, just foods. Um, and it has hydration built into it. And I have the use of engineered foods and also the use of natural foods in there for you. Um, lastly, I have listed some of my favorite nutrition cycling resources, um, websites, um, how to find a dietitian near you. A dietitian, if you met with them, can give you absolute numbers, a meal plan specifically based on your food preferences and your cycling practices. A um, couple great newsletters, some books, and also some cookbooks to go along with it. Um, and this is my dog wearing cycling glasses. Um, but I, I appreciate it. I know we don't have too, many time, too much time for questions. I can probably just take one or two. Um, but if you don't have a burning question, please feel free to email me. Um, I didn't include my phone number. But um, please, please feel free to call me, um, oh, call me, email me anytime, and I'd be happy to get, to get back to you. Absolutely. So it's pure physics. So you get more water in when you gulp. Um, and so generally in about, you can usually gulp about two to three ounces. Um, so it's generally a couple gulps every 15 minutes is a great way to do it. Good question. Uh-huh. Cramping. Yes. Generally dehydration. Generally. Not always. Yeah, absolutely. Easy. It's right there. Um, you fill it up. And the only problem that I have there with the uh, camelback is it's hard to know how much you've drinking 
Where is the bottles? Okay, so you know. Beautiful. The question was um, that she's heard very v different advice about sodium, um, and I think, uh, let me know if I'm, I'm saying this correctly, but that you can actually kind of train your body to need less sodium in exogenous sources, like in food or fluid, over time. Is that correct? Um, to be honest with you, I don't have much experience with that. I haven't had any athletes that have reported that to me. Um, I think that that comes along the lines with the, the theory of periodization, which is a very hot topic in, in cycling and other um, endurance activities right now. And, and to be honest, I am not familiar with that. I apologize. Okay, well, I need to get going and let Dr. Abramson come, but I appreciate your, your attention, and please feel free to contact me anytime. Thank you.